My name is Florian Gellinger. I'm one of the co-founders, co-owners, and visual effects supervisors at RiseFX in Berlin. Our company was um, founded in 2007. And at that point, we had a very difficult choice to make, which was, in the end, a very easy one. Um, we were facing the decision whether to go for a shake, which was already out of development at that time, or to go with Nuke. And we chose to buy a couple of Nukes 4.7 at that time and was the perfect choice, I guess. Yeah. Um, so we grew up with, with, with the software, we built our whole pipeline around it. Um, we adapted to the EXR workflow right away. We built some tools to exchange geometry between Maya, 3ds Max and, and Nuke right away and, and to get all of that a little tied together. Um, and last year, in 2008, we were approached by a German uh, film production, um, by Badlands Film, who were going to shoot a film um, with, well, for an independent movie, I'd say outstanding visual effects. Stuff that, is, that you usually wouldn't see in a, in a German feature film, because the visual effects were all between 14 and 16 seconds long. And if you have an independent film with just one visual effect shot intercut into the movie, it has to stand the test of realism. It just has to look real, not to fall out, and not to be able to tell, just looking at the rest of the movie, what was a visual effect shot and what was not. So um, one of those shots that were really very challenging was uh, a 14 second car crash. Um, the director, Matthias Glasner, wanted to sit right behind the driver and at the end of the shot he wanted to look into the face of his main character uh, played by Jens Albinus, who played uh, the lead role in Dancer in the Dark by Lars from Trier. And um, so we were facing the challenge and the question whether we wanted to shoot it on a green screen stage or not. Uh, is there a way to shoot it with a stunt guy sitting uh, in the driver's seat and then replacing his face. Um, that were all kinds of questions that we asked ourselves. And in the end, we said, no, if, if, the, if you had a stunt guy sitting in the driver's seat, he would wear protective gear um, that we would have to remove as well. It wouldn't look really natural. And it's something different to, re to replace a face. That, and, and it's not like the body language of the original actor. So what we did was, um, First thing we did was we, we uh, created a pre-visualization for the director of the car crash. This is the version of the previous that he approved. Um, this is exactly what he wanted to see. He wanted to stop with the car looking directly at a gas station. Um, and you see an extra coming and there we look right into the face of our main character in the movie. Um, we've got another one looking at the whole thing from the outside. So we knew from the beginning, if you have a handheld camera inside a car that's spinning like that, either you know exactly where the camera is going to look in order to shoot the right background plate, or you have a problem. Um, because, of course, you have to shoot your background first just to know where the street lights are, to time, get the right timing for the light on the car's interior uh, when you're shooting on a green screen stage to know when the car starts spinning, to have the light spinning on the car's interior as well. So there was actually no way around of shooting the background first, although we didn't know the, the exact framing on the, of the handheld camera on the green screen stage at that time. So what we did was uh, we attached two cameras to the hood of the stunt car, one looking straight, And then we just took the stunt car, looked a little bit like a Mad Max type of car, and we stuck all those little tracking marker LEDs on the whole intersection, and we really hit the truck with the stunt car. Um, from our second point of view, from the second camera looking, it's something like that. It's more facing the left. So all together with two uh, 18 millimeter prime lenses on the cameras, we end up having something, including the overlapping area in the middle of the road, something very close to 160 degrees panorama. Um, 
but because the cameras, of course, have a little offset in perspective to one another, we needed to fix that perspective offset by reprojecting the whole thing onto the original street's geometry. There is uh, a plate of the ending of the shot where you see the extras running in when the car stops. There you go. There is the guy who tries to help. And then I'll show you what we did in Nuke to make the whole thing work. To correct this perspective offset of the two 35 millimeter cameras, we had already a very good scene geometry um, of the street from doing the previs. We took all the measurements um, to calculate car speed at what time the truck had to start from what point on the road. So this is our 3D scene. And right there you can see the two cameras that were attached to the car's hood. You can even see the car's hood down there. So this is the camera um, looking to the left and here's the camera looking straight. Um, and it's just reprojecting just by using some Bezier's um, to, to uh, fix the seam in between those two plates. Reprojecting the thing onto this whole street geometry here. Um, and then we're filming the whole thing with the camera that we tracked on the interior of the car to look exactly the way that the um, camera inside the car would have looked onto our street. So I'll, I can show you real quick how that's going to look. So we even have the foreground there um, inside our 3D space. But this is more for a, set, for a setup purpose to check if the vanishing point is all right. Um, there you go. And now I could, for example, just take my, my camera, that's the track camera on the interior of the car, and just move it down a tiny bit. And you see that instantaneously, I can change the whole vanishing point of my background, just like that. Show a little up. 